Hey everyone, uh, before we start today's episode, I wanted to quickly tell you about the membership drive that I am doing on patreon.com slash fire these times to celebrate over two years of this podcast. If we hit the goal of 100 new supporters at $5 or more a month or 50 a year, I'll be able to hire a producer, which would give me more time to focus on the research and interviews and actually start releasing two episodes a week instead of one. If you become a supporter, in addition to getting early access to all episodes, you will also have access to our monthly hangout in which myself and everyone else who supports this project come together and chat about pretty much everything. Um, It happens every month on a Saturday and you have access to the link and everything related to that uh, on Patreon. And lastly, if you cannot donate, you can still support by sharing this podcast with your friends and families and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. This helps get more exposure to this podcast and introduce it to more folks. You can also follow this podcast and project on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Substack, and of course, the main website. So thanks again, everyone, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. I'm Andrew Dana Hudson. I'm a speculative fiction writer, and sometimes I wear some other hats, uh, do some editing, do some sustainability research, do some kind of freelance futuring and and narrative strategy. But um, for the most part, I write stories and uh, I try to make them uh, useful, which I think is one of the things that this this book tries to be. And I I guess I should say I'm uh, now the author of Our Shared Storm, a novel of five climate futures, which came out this, this spring. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thanks for coming on again. I had you on last time. Uh, I think it was the first episode of this year that came out on on Solarpunk, the political economy of Solarpunk, which, uh, or at least the spirit of that episode, I think will definitely revisit it. Uh, but we will primarily be talking about this novel of yours, which obviously I recommend people to 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 check out. It's a fascinating experiment, and obviously we'll we'll get into why. Uh, so the book, as you said, is called Our Shared Storm, a novel of five climate futures. I wanted to kind of get it out of the way so that people listening don't feel like they need to have already read the book uh, to follow a conversation. Uh, you don't have to if you're listening to this. Uh, we will be talking around the book, the themes of the book, and why books like this one, I feel, really matter, essentially. And as I said, you should get it anyway. <laughs> so like to, to anchor our conversation, would you mind telling us a bit about the book? Like what is it, like the general... Um, you know, plots, certain themes, you know, that sort of thing, which we'll get into a bit more in this conversation. Yeah, it does need some introduction, actually, because it's uh, not your usual novel. Um, It is five stories, and each story tries to be kind of the same story, but told in a different way and set in a different future. And the five futures are all inspired by a set of uh, scenarios used by the IPCC and other climate modeling scholars called the shared socioeconomic the shared socioeconomic pathways, the SSPs, and the SSPs have been in development for years. I mean, obviously, because I wrote this book several years ago, um, or at least started it, and uh, but now they are actually showing up as like the core way the SS uh, the IPCC talks about the different trajectories our society might take uh, regarding climate change in the the latest uh, set of reports, the AR6, the sixth assessment report that has been coming out. Um, I think all the all the parts are out now. It, it um, I think it came out in, in the fall was the first one, the physical sciences, and and we've had some really interesting pieces uh, drop since. So, you know, these are. Uh, scholarly concepts, right? These five scenarios. And I'll I'll just mention what they are real quick. SSP1 is the sort of sustainability scenario in which we like do it right. We we stop climate change, we decarbonize, we adapt to the climate change that is coming, we stabilize the planet. And we do so in a way that like generally broadens prosperity and makes everyone happier and healthier. Um, and I guess sort of a, an interesting note is that in the uh, IPCC report, they ended up using two versions 
of SSP1 because uh, I guess they have a 1.5 degree warming version where, which is like, where they're like, we hold it to 1.5 C. And then they have sort of another version where they're like, well, that seems really hard. So we might miss that, but I think we can still call the, call it a win. And if we, you know, reach these goals at 1.7 or, or like just under 2 C. So uh, there's some politicking and how these things kind of uh, finally were deployed, which is very appropriate given the themes of, of my book. But I just used the one. Uh, SSP2 is this middle of the road scenario in which present trends continue. We've got some challenges to mitigation and adaptation. We've got um, some problems, but we've made some progress. It's, it's just sort of like the most recognizable one. Like there's no one trend that kind of swerves us out of our current trajectory. Um, SSP3 is the break, the breakdown scenario. It's the, the sort of normatively the worst one uh, in which we don't manage to do anything about climate change. And we just sort of devolve into conflicts over dwindling fossil energy resources. SSP4 is this uh, inequality scenario in which maybe we do manage to do a bunch of mitigation, but I think uh, it, the, the process of paying for adaptation turns out to be expensive enough that the results are really unequal, right? The rich countries and rich people can pay for it. The poor countries and poor people can't. And it just, the whole... Uh, process of climate change deepens inequality. Uh, and then SSP5 is this high growth scenario, this fossil fueled growth scenario in which basically we don't do any mitigation. We burn all the fossil fuels we can dig up as cheap energy to power development all over the world and uh, pay for adaptation in various ways. Um, and, you know, consequences be damned, but business is booming. So um, I don't do them in that order in the book. Uh, I reorder them to create uh, a little more of a, a novelistic feel, um, kind of starting from the familiar in SSP2 and then moving into some of these uh, weirder uh, visions and, and then kind of coming to the, the sort of terrible breakdown, more uh, dystopian possibility. And then finishing off with the with the happy ending, the SSP one, the sustainability scenario. So, um, oh, and I, I while I'm mentioning things about how they're using the report, SSP four is not included the uh, inequality scenario in in the final in in this report, um, which is interesting. I think it's uh, you know the argument that. I heard made was that it wasn't as distinct enough of, of an emissions pathway to be worth including, but obviously it's very, um, it's a touchy subject, right? Like the, to be approved by the powers that be, um, the IPCC documents are all very political in nature, sadly. And, um, you know, particularly the, the big summaries have to be vetted by all kinds of powerful interests. And, um, so, you know, the inequality question is is inconvenient for uh the people who are who are in charge. Yeah. So, so it... yeah, so that's so the book is is basically trying to illustrate and explore and critique all these scenarios by having four core characters show up in each story, uh change their perspective, but in each story they're all different people living different lives because of the path that our society has taken over the, the coming 30 years, and uh, specifically around climate change, around climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, and I guess sort of the last element is that the, the book is set at the COP, the Conference of the Parties uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, right? This is the annual big climate negotiations that the UN does. And 
uh, I went in, in 2014 in Poland and Katowice uh, to uh, 20, sorry, 2018 uh, to COP24. And it's such a interesting, unique culture that I really wanted to, uh, I guess, explore and, and kind of critique critique it and it serves as kind of the the setting and kind of the fifth character because we see how the cop is different in each story it's it kind of becomes a different sort of institution depending on the the path we choose so uh yeah and and hopefully it's it's a fun uh read but i i think um you know the the goal of of the book is to uh one show you both these the sort of dystopian possibilities and the utopian possibilities like right next to each other right not try to come down on one side or another but show that these are live choices that we can still uh, affect the outcome on uh, and to help us understand these institutions and the politics that are, uh, of the processes that we're using to try and stop climate change right now and see the ways in which they're inadequate or the ways in which they're they're full of promise um I think, you know, it's the hardest thing human beings have ever have ever tried to do. And um, we should care about the ways in which we're trying to, to do them. So is that that was kind of a long winded summary, but hopefully that gets us there. No, it was fantastic. Uh, I, I really think one of the one of the ways I really appreciated this book and the kind of the even like the intention behind it is is this idea that the future isn't just this one thing and you know that there's a there's a quite a lot of agency uh and in some sense you're giving back agency to to the characters if that makes sense because there are these different scenarios different futures as you said set in the year 2054 i believe so th- about 30 years from now in buenos aires in argentina the cop um and it's it's a way of kind of you know there will be many many more cops to to go before the 2054 one assuming they go on yearly until then um and every year we're making or people in power specifically especially are making specific decisions that affect the cop that come after it and what is often uh missing um in discourses around the cop and i mean this goes around climate change in general is this idea that um the very specific decisions are being made that could be otherwise in the sense that there are um politiquing as you mentioned this is one thing we see even affecting the reports themselves i should say i had two ipcc authors um when was it one second, a few months ago uh with uh, dr rupa mukherjee and dr lisa shipper uh, the title of that uh, episode was the urgency of the ipcc report and we also spoke about this actually a bit i mean it was obviously more specifically on the report itself and that sort of thing but uh, we we spoke about the importance of fiction. The, the, they recommended uh, someone like Amitav Ghosh, for example, who has been talking about climate change and the unthinkable, uh, which I know I actually reference, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So there's been this, I guess, um, I, I'm curious what you think about this, like an increased awareness, I suppose, uh, in the past few years with stuff like Solarpunk, which obviously I had you on uh, earlier this year to talk about as well, as I said before, and other like just... Broad, more broadly speaking, like climate fiction, and uh, I'll talk about this a bit more after like hearing your thoughts on this. I'm I'm going to, I think it's probably it's probably, it will probably be done by the time this episode comes out. But I'm going to speak with um, Julia Steinberger, uh, who's now a good friend at Lausanne in Switzerland in in well next week I think, and the title of that public conversation is going to be um, whatever the French equivalent of uh, from from the IPCC to solar punk or something like that is going to be called. So she, she would be the climate scientist in that, in that situation. Obviously she is a climate scientist. She, she has written IPCC reports and so on. Um, and I'll be the person talking about solar punk essentially. And what's, what's interesting is I think it is, you know, it's a sign that this is being taken a bit more seriously, essentially the, the, the role of fiction isn't, is no longer just, although lots of people were already disagreeing with this, um, framework i suppose but like you know okay i'm gonna pin this for now but i'm curious as to whether you think that there has been an increased awareness and the importance of what importance of books like these essentially books like this one i mean uh in in tackling climate change i it's not just a you know uh quote unquote like reality versus fiction that the 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 line between these two is actually 
you know blurred in that sense yeah um well the 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 caveat i always give nowadays is that i think fiction is is necessary but not sufficient right like it is very easy for us to imagine writing all kinds of really compelling uh climate fiction stories and creating climate art and doing all this culture making and still not being able to pass policy. Um, so, you know, it, it is, but it is, I think, really hard to imagine us getting policy without all this culture making happening, right? It, it is hard to imagine the kind of culture wide, civilization wide mobilization that we need happening if we aren't telling stories and, creating art and like making it um, into our, you know, we, we got to manufacture some consent here a little bit, right? Like it, it is, um, we, that, that we need to kind of get people on board with this project um, and culture making is a way that we do that, right? It's how we got people on board with, um, you know, petroculture projects like like cars everywhere and highways, right? TV and movies played a huge role in um, sort of spurring the, the the glamorization of the open highway and that sort of thing. Um, but to you know, to your question, are are people changing? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, you know, Amitav Ghosh wrote his book in in 2016, 2017. I think the great derangement, which is a really interesting text and kind of uh, calling out specifically the literary community of why there wasn't a lot of uh, literature about climate change, given that this was a thing that was going to matter to people. Right. Like we, you know, we we have literature about war and disease and and all all these other sort of axes of of human suffering slavery and and uh discrimination and and uh all this but there just hadn't been much literature that took the the threat of climate change seriously um you know caveat there being in the literary sort of community right not the science fiction community um so you know you talk to science fiction writers about amitav ghosh's book and they're like well screw that guy. I've been writing about climate change for 30 years. Um, and I think that's fair. Um, but, but it's nonetheless a very interesting book. And I think it changed a lot of minds. Uh, and so we are seeing a lot of literature, lit- sort of capital L literary writers tackling climate change or including climate change or honestly being really speculative, um, like breaking out of of you know breaking into sort of other genre territory a bit um in, because there's no other way to to talk about the, these sort of unfolding issues and we've had a lot of good good books a lot of um good projects you know and and like last year stan robinson took his ministry for the future book on the road to to cop 26 and did like a huge uh, number of, of events and different kinds of, um, uh, you know, it was, and it seemed, you know, hearing him report it back that there is, you know, in the halls of power and in this sort of diplomatic world, like an increasing interest in these kinds of, uh, imaginary, uh, or imagination based tools to, help us grasp and grok and talk about the, the problem. And ministry is a great one. Um, and, you know, I think my book is also uh, a contribution. I'm hoping to find a way to make it to COP27 this year so I can, like, put it in the hands of some of these these uh, people that, um, you know, the, the book is really about, right? Because it's about the, the people who go every year to the COP to try to save the world and are doing so kind of badly. Um you know, that's, and, and they all know it, right? So um, hopefully uh, that'll find it, that, that'll be, be useful too. Um, and, you know, it, there, there's lots of small ways that this stuff is showing up in, in kind of bigger popular culture. 
you know, the the new Batman movie is like weirdly a climate like the the true enemy is the sea, right? Like spoiler <laughs> alert that you know, the big um the the you know, as much as it's about like the Riddler and Bruce Wayne brooding, right? Like the big disaster happens because Gotham has to be protected by a seawall now. Mm. And uh, if you blow up the seawall, you flood the city. And, you know, I, I think that's uh, like a really kind of, it, it, it wasn't, you know, I, I didn't love the movie, but um, I thought that was a really contemporary choice. So, um, yeah, I, I think that there there is this percolation. Um but we obviously just need a lot more, right? Like it's not enough to percolate. We have to have this tidal wave if we're gonna really shift the 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 weight of events. Uh, absolutely. I haven't seen that the film yet, but th- that's interesting. Um I do like how you, you the fact that there is a cop on a yearly basis for me also helps obviously compare and contrast um you know expectations versus reality uh you know an optimistic scenario pessimistic scenario you know that sort of thing which is it's a useful way of at least assessing which is you know it's always imperfect and lots of critiques obviously um are made and should be made about these things but it's a way of assessing uh whether we are making progress whether the progress is fast enough or whether we're actually making things worse, uh, which there's, I mean, in, in some ways we, we also are, um, not because of the cop itself, but because, just because of the general direction of how things are going. And, okay, so in, in the book you write, uh, there's this really great quote, which I will, I will read out here, like all fiction that speculates about the future has embedded in it a theory of social, social change. As it happens, so um, the Egyptian human rights activist um, Al Abdel Fattah, in his book "You Have Not Yet Been Defeated," I think it's called. People should check it out. It's basically like a collection of his um, essay, blog posts, and so on. Uh, I should say, uh, since I'm, I mentioned him, that he's currently still in prison. His situation is very bad, um, so I just wanted to bring it up as well. So, in in his book, he has this uh, sentence. He wrote that the crisis is not in awareness of the danger of climate change, it is in our inability to imagine alternative ways of organizing our lives, uh, end quote. And that's very useful because I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of um, there was this TV series called uh, One Day at a Time. It was on Netflix for a while and then stopped, whatever. And there's a character in it who she's like the you know she's the queer activist very self uh, climate conscious like being the progressive in the family and that sort of thing and the the way it's framed in that um tv series and i'm just using it as an example because it's a very common trope very common thing is you know it's it's basically like you know recycle and and it's like individual choices individual things so everything's about the individual and while there is a role uh, of the, for the individual, obviously, these broader and more structural problems tend to be obfuscated because they require different political imaginaries. And I think this is partly at least what, what Ala was, was getting at in, in, in that text. I'm curious as to, can you talk about the, the, the whole, the link between, um, you know, speculations about the future or f- fictions that speculate about the future and the importance of having a theory of social change and the kind of follow-up to that is whether we can argue that even when there isn't a theory of social change or at least when when it's not explicitly stated it's sort of always implicitly there in one way or another yeah um you know my, my my riff there is really kind of talking about this question of like is climate fiction um like does it deserve a different shelf than science fiction right um and you know was the or should all should we expect like is all science fiction should it be climate fiction now i think that's a good argument too but i think they're you know where i come down is that they do different things um and give us sort of a different um sense of how history unfolds right um and that those are not the only theories that might drive a speculative work about the future, right? You could, 
you know, you, I saw someone on Twitter a while back ask, like, if we have, um, if we have climate fiction, why can't we have housing fiction that is about the, you know, the future driven, the science fictional future driven by the housing crisis? And I'm like, you know, that's a great idea. Like, there isn't actually a reason why we shouldn't do that. Like, people should go and write that. Because, you know, the more the more we can um, get out of the our our sense that I think science fiction has has partially been responsible for instilling in people that for the most part, like technology is going to just happen and society is going to change around technology. And like, that's really just like how the history happens. Um, we're going to invent stuff and then we're just going to like live with the consequences of those inventions. I think that's a really bad strategy. I think instead we should recognize that uh, inventing new gadgets doesn't necessarily uh, make our world better, doesn't necessarily lead to um, better policies and outcomes for people, which is something that would be really shocking, right? Like if you showed the alligator graph, uh, which I've been talking about lately, it's a, it's, it's a, a graph of like productivity and wages um, as that, you know, starting in like after the, the, in the post-war era, right? Like these two lines go up very steadily. And then they diverge in a way that looks like an alligator opening his mouth. Um, productivity keeps going up, the, meaning the, the amount of, of uh, productive value that comes from an hour of, of a wage laborer's work uh, keeps going up because our machines are getting better, our processes are getting better. But wages stagnate. Those stay the same. The the increased gains in productivity are not going to the wage laborers, right? I think if you go back to um, some of the, the sort of early science fiction, like golden age authors and show them that graph, they would find it kind of shocking because, you know, as much as, as there's always been a critique of technology in science fiction, I think that there's there's the the sense that these things can be like completely decoupled is is really uh is new is is something that goes against the the sort of modernist instinct um so now we've had this uh for a good um 50 years right uh i think it first sort of diverges in most versions of the graph in 1972 and you know, we we can see that what matters actually is uh, is public policy, is uh, levels of unionization, is uh, all these other things that are not just that we have agency over, right? That people can change. So we don't just that are not um, just a matter of of what the sort of technological base of society is. So um, you know, for for me, this says that we have to go out and uh, th- that, you know, the, f- the future can, can go either way. And, and it's, it's really our, our sort of political choices that uh, make the difference. Um, I think there was another part of your question. Well, it's, I, yeah, let me repeat it. If that's okay. So a lot of, so I guess the, the question is that, I suppose the claim that I would make or the argument I would make is that ideology is basically everywhere, even when it's not recognized yeah. as such. And so I, I would watch, um, and I, I mean, I don't blame anyone for watching these films. I watch them all the time. It's not, that's not the issue, but there are certain, you know, the Avengers, uh, certain superhero movies, um, and whatnot. And I bring this up because I think it's a frame of reference that most people would understand. Um, there's a certain, you know, there is a problem. The problem is usually bad guys are somewhere, solution, good guys, destroy bad guys or something along those lines. And it, it tends to be um, individualistic in the sense of these are very special individuals that have superpowers and whatnot. Sure, they need to work together, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's a group of individuals. 
there's less a focus on structural issues, on on problem of the commons, on on there's a sort of a a tendency in a lot of um, I'm gonna say popular fiction, or I'm being very very generalistic here, and you know it's not necessarily fair, but the trend tends to be, I think. And again, I, it's not entirely fair, but it's it's kind of just out there and it's worth talking about, I think, that stuff like income inequality, uh, housing crisis, uh, other forms of inequalities, racism and whatnot, while they are sometimes brought up, they're not often brought up as something that we can do something about. You know, it's like the future is bad, it's dystopian, you have the, you know, the rich people somewhere, the poor people elsewhere and whatnot. And maybe something is done about it then, as in, you know, there's a revolt, there's something which is, you know, always interesting to explore, of course, uh, because to some extent these are realistic scenarios. But there's often less emphasis on how did it get this way and what could have been done to prevent it, i.e. like the solutions are not seen as, or the potential solutions are not seen as worthy of exploration in the same way as the problems, if that, if that makes sense. So... I guess the, the question, if I could frame it, frame it, phrase it in a question, is um, what happens to fiction when the ideology behind it, if that makes sense, isn't acknowledged as such, as in it's taken as essentially, you know, the, the normative way of seeing things? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you, you, you uh, characterize it well that the, you know, our, our sort of some of our core modern myths, right? Like the MCU is maybe there's a sense of kind of structural problems of the world, but really there, there's sort of a sense that there, there's a, a normal and right equilibrium. And then someone in, in a crazy costume comes in and uh, disturbs it. And we need heroes to go and, uh, eliminate that person with extreme prejudice. Um, and, you know, whenever, whenever it's funny, like the, the only ones who ever have ideas in the MCU movies pretty much are the villains, right? Um, Killmonger in, in Black Panther, mm -hmm. right? He had ideas. He was going to go like arm revolutionary <laughs> struggles around the world. I'm like, yeah, like, come on, Killmonger, let's do it. And it's so funny to see that that the uh, like <clears throat> the epic sort of bomb ticking sort of like timer is are the the weapons going to go off are going to be allowed to like fly fly off and you know be given to you know presumably oppressed peoples that could really use them. Um, oh yeah, so sorry. Let me. I I read somewhere. That essentially what he wanted was to create Black Panthers <laughs> like in the in the yeah. in the you know U.S. Black Panther um, group sort of thing, and it was the Black Panther in the Black Panther that was preventing him from doing so. But anyway, yeah, sorry, continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I no, it's it. I mean, it's it's really interesting, and I think that's a case in which the sort of standardized form of the MCU story bumps up against probably some of the 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 real ideology uh, like the, there's the ideology by committee and then there's the kind of the ideology of the auteur and you can i think we see a little friction there maybe not i mean maybe the the director really does think that like i don't know what they did at the end like a a a, a sort of science and technology like charter school in oakland that funded by wakanda is the is actually the way forward but you know, and Thanos, he had a he had a policy proposal. <laughs> he had a policy proposal that nobody engaged in debate with him on. Mm -hmm. Like there is zero. No, everyone's just like, you're crazy. You're you're the mad titan. Nobody ever says like, hey, I don't think that, you know, that that it's going to work that way. Like, I, what about all the planets where they aren't like people aren't starving? What about like X, Y, Z? Um, that, that for me was like an unforgivably bad, uh, way of doing that, that movie. Um, and you know, I, okay, this is, I mean, only since you, you, you brought this up, but it, on my medium somewhere, I actually wrote, rewrote a, 
a treatment of how I would have done uh, Avengers Infinity War. All right, you did, you uh, did. Uh, no, no, bring it up if that's okay. It is relevant to our conversation. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically, I I make it more sort of comic booky and and want Thanos to not be to be to be like uh, obsessed with the way he is in the comic book of like um, courting Lady Lady Death, right? Uh, and not have this genocidal policy proposal that you know that you no one sort of actually intellectually discusses with him right no nobody discusses on his terms and he isn't willing to like you know he doesn't meaningfully try and win anyone over um so anyways if people want to look that up and read it maybe that'll be fun it was fun I'll, to I'll write include it. Um, i'll include it in the description <laughs> sure yeah um yeah i mean i think to your to your kind of broader question um I, I guess I think, yeah, there's so, you know, we, we do need um, to be, we do need the, the ideas and the imaginaries, like they are a necessary, if not sufficient component, right? I think, um, I think this is an Adrian Marie Brown line, right? That we're in an imagination battle that, and I don't think that's the only kind of battle we're in, right? Like, like every struggle, it happens on multiple fronts. There are material aspects. There are uh, ideological aspects. There's just like interpersonal aspects. All like, and those kinds of, of different dynamics and constraints are ones that I try to highlight in, in my book, right? That, you know, the opening story is called Politics is Personal. And it really focuses on all the ways in which we have this big, giant diplomatic apparatus, but that the the outcomes tend to be swerved by thousands of small human decisions like you know like does some is someone like sick that day uh does someone uh can so and so call in a favor like who has a crush on who right all, all these all these kind of small very personal uh foibles that nonetheless are are we we try to iron out through this process of committee but um the result is is a system that has to have like at its heart this kind of inherent mediocrity right that that will never fully um be as i guess as uh um effective as, as we want and and you know maybe we just need to uh, admit and acknowledge that that's how that's how institutions work, right? They're always going to be a little less than we want them to be, and the the best we can hope for is to kind of keep them like above above water in terms of like net positivity. Um, it, it's you know, and it's but it's a debate that's that's had in the story between Noah the the perspective character and, and saga who's like get out of here with this like let's be friends stuff you know i'm trying to do politics and politics happens when there are millions not just like a few thousand like uh over educated and overdressed uh you know technocrats getting together so um but you know all of this is like the the thing in the uh, about the book that I'm really proud of is that all five stories should try basically take aspects of our climate politics that already exist and just carry them forward, blow them up, put them under the magnifying glass. Um, the all the all five versions of the cop are the part of how the cop is today already right like it already is this place where you're like you know trying to you've got five minutes and it's like do i run to the bathroom or do i try to like sh like you know schmooze of these people or do i like get a coffee from the free coffee place right like the it's already got all these sorts of like personal mediocrities and 
uh, uh, kind of permeating it. It's already a trade fair, the way it is in the second story, where there are all these startups there trying to like hook the interest of of uh, various, you know, important people and uh, get, sort of promote themselves and and their climate solutions. It's already a place where the rich and powerful meet to discuss the fates of millions of, of people who are not rich and powerful, who don't get much of a voice. It's a place where, where, where scientists are going and just kind of calling out how, like just charting our failure, our descent into the hothouse. And it's a place where people are legitimately gathering to reimagine human life in a, a truly beautiful way, you know, which is exactly the charge that that Egyptian uh, activist you mentioned gave us, right? Um, it is a, a, about reimagining human life. It's, you know, that's the, like, there's the Le Guin sort of formulation of that too, right? That um, uh, capitalism seems unsurpassable, but at one point, so did the divine right of kings. And we all know how that went, though. I don't know. You look at the UK, they're still pretty into their their monarch, I guess. Sorry, just to dig at them for the the jubilee, uh, the jubilee nonsense. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, and then there's a second part of that where she says, you know, any human power can be changed by human action, and often that action starts or is catalyzed by by art. So, um, you know, I I hope she's right. Like I'm kind of neutral on that. I'm like playing my part on the the basis that that she is, but I do occasionally fear that like, oh man, I should just be going out and and installing some solar panels instead of writing stories that that would be a more impactful use of my time. Just go go plant a tree or sabotage a pipeline or something, right? But um but these are all uh but I I think, you know, my core theory is that it has to be a collective, uh, a collective endeavor, and that means that you know, in any collective endeavor, you do have to do some of some of what you don't like doing, but you also, if it's big and and uh, and lively and joyous enough, you get to create the things that you're really interested in uh, as well. And for me, that's like writing these kinds of stories. So, yeah, and. Uh, talk a bit about it's it's going to be, it's going to be in the title, but I forgot to actually bring it up as a term. But like the post normal fiction, yeah. Um, how how would you explain it for like folks who don't know what it is? Yeah, so this is one of my I guess theoretical um, uh, uh, formulations that I try to kind of add to the to our discussion around these topics in this book. Um, so. In sustainability studies, which is what I I did a grad program on at ASU a few years ago, um, and I wrote this book originally as my master's thesis, I should mention. Um, uh, So in sustainability, there's a term called post-normal science that is used to kind of frame what sustainability is and, and how it operates and why it's still a science, even though it's oftentimes you know, it's about people going out and trying to like work in the real world rather than, than the lab. And and so the argument is that they have this graph and one axis of the graph is stakes and the other axis is uncertainty. And so at a point of zero stakes, zero uncertainty, that's just like running. It's like pure mathematics. That's like experiments in a laboratory where it does not matter what the outcome of the experiment is for the broader world, right? Like a a negative result is just as informative as a positive result. You can rerun experiments as many times as you want using different variables to try to like find the solution, right? That is pure, pure research. And as you go out from that zero point on either, um, on either access or, or, you know, a mix of both, you get into this realm of like applied science. Okay, it kind of matters uh, how we're using science to like uh, create different sorts of infrastructure and technology. You get out to professional consultancy. 
um, where scientists are like called in by policymakers to like offer judgments, right? Like, you know, there's higher stakes to those decisions. And then eventually you get out into this realm where, yeah, the stakes are high. The, um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Often values are in dispute as well. And, you know, time is running out. Like you, it's these wicked problems where there, there might not be one clear solution. In fact, like solutions have different winners and losers. Um, that's a realm they call post-normal science, right? Where you're no longer doing this Kuhnian process of, of research, 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 theoretical uh, revolution, research, research, research to tidy up all the, the sort of implications of that, right? That's sort of normal Kuhnian science. Um, I'm referring to Thomas Kuhn and the structures. Thomas Kuhn is the structure of science of scientific revolution. It's a very useful book to, to skim uh, once in your life. And, um, you know, at, in post-normal science, you... The, the argument is that it, it's nothing like that, but you're still doing science, right? We can formulate what we're doing as a, a as part of the scientific process and part of scientific in, inquiry, even though it, in some ways, it looks nothing like how we've conceived of it. So, you know, I, I take that basic idea and and kind of bring it to the world of fiction and other types of of you know in, content creation, right? And basically, say that. We're all in this post-normal situation where uncertainty is high. We don't know what the correct actions are and, or strategies are to uh, get us the future we want. And stakes are really high. We're like, well, things are going to get really bad if we don't make the correct choices. Um, and and values are in dispute, right? We're, you know, no matter what we do on climate change, there are going to be different winners and losers um, and, and our, our actions really matter, right? Like it's a situation which we're not just creating stories based on our own, just what, you know, what sounded cool to us. We're not just creating stories based on what the market wants, but we're also, as I think a lot of writers are motivated by a kind of like, I need to be a part of the solution, Right. And I think, so So I call it post-normal fiction when you are writing fiction that feels like it's, it, it has this in, intent to impact the real world around these wicked problems and that, that recognizes the, the stakes of the narratives and imaginaries that stories help create and is like deliberate about doing so, about it, it you know the the role that we're we're doing so so that's <clears throat> so that, so for me that that's kind of one of I guess the contributions of the book this this concept and you know different people found it interesting and that, and so that's been really gratifying I think um, you know the some people have talked about sort of the normal being this like kind of capitalist realism zone and. Um, the post noble kind of showing that uh, that that's sort of that's limited. I, I I think the as time goes on, I've talked about it more in terms of yeah, this notion of of uh, at a certain point we we got into the mindset that every every all of our actions were just going to be sort of like perturbations of a market, right? These are just going to be market exchanges and the market like it, in some ways like contains the energy, right? We, you go in and you like, you buy a commodity, there's less of the commodities. So the price of the, the rest like increase, right? Like that's all, that's how, like how the market is supposed to work as this like buffer to contain human uh, and and uh, extra human inputs, right? Okay, but but that is no longer the case, right? Like the market cannot prov uh, 
contain all human inputs because the market has decided that a bunch of human inputs are particularly car carbon dioxide are fine to dump into the atmosphere. And as a result, we're changing the planet and, and uh, getting all of these uh, external, all these externalities are going to start battering down our door, already battering down our door. So, um, you know, it's about kind of recognizing that there's something else going on here other than we're all creating products and, uh, and selling them and, you know, having them sort of judged and evaluated and given a price and, uh, um, and sort of sold at, at the, the price at which they they should be right like they're we're we're doing things that actually matter that are not just market interactions uh and that have consequences for the rest of humanity and for every generation of of humanity that's that's on the way so yeah i mean it's it's like the difference between fiction that is actionable in some sense and fiction that is not necessary so like i and this is an example I've, I've given a number of times. Like when I, I have, you know, read a lot of the rings or stuff like that, I don't necessarily read this with the um, knowledge or, or what have you. Like I don't necessarily read this and think, oh, well, this is very useful for 2022, you know, or this is if we don't do this or we don't. I mean, there's some critique of society. You can think about power to some extent. More, a lot of stories do that, but it's more like the escapism that I get or the value that I get in reading a lot of things is just it's the escapism almost for its own sake. It's it's like uh, in a, a way of expanding the imagination and that in and of itself is, is a good in, in that sense. But yeah, the, I mean, yeah. fantasy in particular, right, is very conservative in, mm -hmm. in ideology. I mean, this was something I was reading about this yesterday in uh, the counter craft uh, sub stack by uh, Lincoln Michelle, I think. Um, and yeah, made, made the point that in fantasy, any attempt to ch like change society is viewed as uh, a threat that has to be like heroically beaten back. You know, and like it, anyone who, who you know, it, you never have like social reformers in high fantasy and uh, in, in high fantasy stories. You only have dark lords, right? And, you know, in Lord of the Rings, it's very coded as industrialization too, right? Like in the, the orcs and the Orukai are all like in these like coal smeared factories and that are threatening the, the pristine lives of the good English uh, hobbits on the countryside. So, uh, yeah, I think, but, and, you know, if that's... That is, you know, fundamentally a conservative uh, view of, of social change. And, um, well, it's, it's, uh, it, and, and it's very, it is very escapist, right? It, I mean, it's the same, the, the, I think a lot of fiction is inherently like this. It's, it's, you know, detective fiction is always like someone has like, perverted the social contract someone's violated the social contract but once the mystery is solved right like once you know who the culprit is it is uh just in like then it's a it's a clear path to enacting justice right when usually getting the justice is much harder than finding out who did it right um and figuring out what even is just in in uh you know that con in our our you know very unjust and unequal context um anyway sorry i i just wanted to <laughs> spiel a little bit there no 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 this, this is excellent thanks um some reason i was thinking also of princess mononoke which the other example i was going to give of it is also in that sense you have this uh tolkien-esque or whatever like uh fear of industrialization or at least skepticism towards industrialization but in some sense, it's also slightly more nuanced in the sense that you end up kind of understanding whether um, the the villagers who were following whatever her name was, um, yeah, you kind of understand where they come from. And so it, this is sort of a more nuanced take that. But anyway, the reason I kind of bring it up is that 
it's sort of the the um, I guess is the and that's probably what I will bring up again in that uh, public discussion I mentioned before that I'm gonna have next week on on like from the IPCC to Solarpunk. It's it's something that I feel needs to be taken more seriously, and I guess this is you know to some extent why I'm doing episodes like this one, making the case that something like Solarpunk, which is what I'm I try to focus on these days, isn't just escapism uh, a la Lord of the Rings, as I mentioned. Uh, it's definitely not conservative, uh, which arguably a lot of things definitely is. At least elements of it is there. Um, it's more really about, it's like a response to something. You know, it's a answer to cyberpunk or a challenge to cyberpunk. It's a um, response to the modern world and the particular configurations of the modern world and how it doesn't have to be this way, that the future doesn't have to be the present. You know, it's that whole like, there, what was it? I actually wrote it down while we were talking. Like th- there were better futures in the past. It's that is that assume mm-hmm. is that is that argument that at the very least, when you know the original Star Trek, the the whole like the we you know we we could go to the moon, therefore we can go somewhere else. We can do these things. You know the the future was kind of there was this idea. It was at least with all the criticism that we can muster against this, like there was at least something to move forward to. There was at least something, you know. Uh, the universe could be explored. There was so, some path forward in that sense. Whereas at some point, and I've, I've read arguments that this is a kind of a result of, of capitalist realism and instead of like neoliberalism, that sort of thing. The idea that anything that isn't outside of the market and the magic of the market and the invisible hand of the market and you know that sort of thing, even it, it kind of percolated uh, that realism, that capitalist realism, even percolated in in fiction like the mcu that you mentioned before like even as you mentioned black panther a a film that has it's kind of a fascinating i've, I've seen it a number of times because it, it has uh, not solo punky necessarily but like certain elements of it are there but at the same time it's not it's still a you know it's a hierarchical society and the big solution that's sort of proposed in the end, and I hope this isn't the spoiler, I'm assuming most people have seen it by now, is like, you know, we'll open some outreach somewhere and we'll talk to the UN and we'll join the UN and we'll, we will, you know, export our technology. But like, it's not really explained how that's going to happen without <laughs> imperialist power kind of coming in and taking it from you. But, you know, it's it's a different kind of... Anyway, I'm rambling a bit. But the idea, the, the reason why... I, I kind of focus on these things from time to time. It's just this idea that it doesn't have to be this way. Like if a story is in a certain way, the story could be differently. And that, that's why it uh, could be different. Like the reason why I like the fact that you have five different stories is that in, in that sense, it's this is 2054, this is COP, this is Buenos Aires. This might be what it look like looks like if we have, uh, what's it called? SSP 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And obviously, you're not you're not even suggesting that these are the only five uh, futures. Obviously, there's like multitudes of futures, and the idea is that those futures depend on the present. And I think this is sort of what I what I what I get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, one one of the scary things about writing a book that sort of fundamentally says, okay, we, we you know our choices are going to. Uh, nudge us into one of these scenarios or another or some other like wilder thing is like, okay, like I, you know, I wrote that at a time where uh, it felt like, uh, yeah, the, the sort of options are open, but our options are closing, right? Like the, we are running out of time, you know, and we, where we do have to, to act, we do have to, to sort of get the, get the numbers down, we the emissions numbers down, we got to get the renewable energy up, we've got to, you know, it's a big, it's a big project, and it can go either way. And that's really scary. Um, I think um, I think, though, that one thing that I hope is in the spirit of the book is that even though it you know we we occasionally hear um we have like 36 months to save the world or we have we have 
30 i saw one that was like we have 30 weeks to save to save the planet to like pass and and i you know sometimes i think those are mobilizing sometimes i think they're um kind of demobilizing demoralizing um but the the point is you know this to borrow a phrase from from my friend jay springett right like we have 10 years to save the world but it's going to take 100 years to do it and it's going to be like politics and discussion and tweaking our strategy and keeping people on board and fighting off the various ways in which it tries to be co-opted um the various ways in which and reforming it all throughout right like there's no point at which this stops being politics in which like we we are now locked in forever to the question of how will we manage the planet's atmosphere right right now we're trying to just stabilize it because it is a runaway train and we are trying to find the brakes we we're trying to figure out how to turn off the engine that is like accelerating us towards the cliff but even if if we uh manage to do that we're still going to have to decide on like some basic things about the train we're going to have to decide where it goes where it stops um you know the what temperature we like keep the planet at right what is the optimum level of atmospheric carbon if we were to uh stop emitting carbon and hopefully build up a a big climate uh repair infrastructure like a whole bunch of, of carbon removal machines and other uh, you know natural systems that can get a lot of carbon back out of the atmosphere so it can stop warming the planet right so it put it in a place where it's not contributing to either um radiative forcing uh or you know, we also don't want it in the ocean because that then that's how we're uh, acidifying the ocean, which is also a catastrophe, right? But so we put it away, but then it's like, okay, just, but now we've got like a nozzle, right? Like if we have the this stuff in storage, we can always release it again. What is, like, how far down do we go? Do we want to go to exactly to like pre-industrial? Pre-industrial was kind of cold, right? Like the industrial age started like kind of coming out of an ice age little mini one um maybe we want to keep it like around like i don't know 315 or something like this right um but if we do that then you know where wherever we set the number there's going to be winners and losers this is going to be something that's going to be debated constantly even in the scenario in which we we um are successful at this particular moment of of like starting to up the basic uh set of actions that we need and in the scenarios in which we're not successful man it still matters if we if we like how much carbon we put out right like the difference between two degrees and 2.5 degrees is enormous the difference like every ton of carbon at you know every molecule of carbon does make a difference um so even if if we sort of catastrophically fail to like win climate action, man, the, there is a whole band of failure and and different valences of failure, right? Like there's the the types of failure in which um, it's a it's a failure because may because uh, power has has come into the hands of of has been concentrated you know wealth has been concentrated into smaller and smaller hands and there's types of failure in which it's it's like institutions break down or um societies just like lose their uh sense of self like there's just all kinds of of ways that can go wrong and all kinds of ways that can go right and you know normative choices to be made along the way about um about how what kind of like people we want to be and what kind of society we want to live in um so that i mean for me that's kind of the core message that i that i try and bring to all my work and particularly this book is that just like politics never stops right and you know i mean this is kind of funny i was reading like a review of my book today um by uh michael uh fink 
And he made a really good point that I wish I had made in the book that a lot of uh, a lot of climate fiction that is more apocalyptic tends to be this kind of like deluge, have this kind of mythos of the of the deluge, right? That where it's sort of sinful industrial society washed away by a wrathful God and nature. And it's this kind of reinscribing of Chris, Christian mythology or biblical mythology onto the modern situation. And, you know, not, not being a situation in which, uh, yeah, in, in, in which politics continues where, you know, uh, we, we, we don't think that, like, sometimes you see jokes about this, right? You're, you see cartoons joking about, like, the, the debates about, like, who, which animals Noah led on the ark, Right. But that's like a real debate that we have about like who goes on the endangered species list, right? Like what species do we think are worthy of protecting uh, or, or need our, our help, right? Like we constantly have those that make those decisions. And uh, so it's just gonna, it's just gonna be like that. Um, it's not going to be this, this like one and done uh, apocalypse. And we just spend the rest of our, of, of our days sort of like bemoaning the, that our, our predecessors, you know, had uh, um, been so foolish as to incur God's wrath. Right. Like, anyways, that's, that's a bit of a rant, but hopefully a useful one. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I, I often think of that movie that came out a billion years ago, like the day after tomorrow and Mm -hmm. the, how I think it's, very indicative of a lot of what we might call like climate apocalypse stuff. And the the thing about the day after tomorrow is it kind of portrays climate change as a thing that's going to happen on essentially a day or like a few days or whatever. And then we will learn our lesson. The president is going to come on TV and say, mother nature has taught us a lesson and we will, you know, be better after that as if, the fact that we're even if that is the case, the the consequences that led to those few days of catastrophes will still be with you uh, even after those, those few days. Therefore, there will be more days like that. But anyway, and the reason why I bring it up is that there is, or at least, it's sort of like so. The reason I, I have a lot of issues with um, apocalyptic scenarios although they're not necessarily wrong it's more that how useful can they be and this is all mobilizing versus demobilizing that you mentioned before and i will just say uh quickly that i had recently Alyssa hall on um that's a few episodes uh ago the topic uh sorry the, the podcast is called climate narratives that go beyond the apocalypse and it's based on this 2019 essay that she wrote for lit hub called hope punk and solar punk on climate narratives that go beyond the apocalypse hence the title and it's about her how she as a science teacher talks about climate change to her students who are i think mostly in high school and how this whole like we have 30 months we have whatever it is how it's interpreted if in 30 months you turn 16 or in 30 months you turn 18 or you know and how how what can you do about an information like how how can your brain even process an information like that so it's sort of that and this is why i sort of see for me fiction like the good kind of fiction at least the fiction i think is more interesting like this book and solar punk books and and hope punk climate fiction other stuff what have you and they don't necessarily have to be positive don't get me wrong like it's there, there is a role for dystopias. There is a role for pessimistic futures, what have you. It's, it doesn't have to all be uh, rosy and, and good and whatever. It's more that it allows us to have different things to latch on to when reality gets a bit too much. And that, that that's what it is for me. It's It doesn't mean that if I, and this is, again, example I, I brought up a billion times, but when I watch Star Trek, I don't necessarily think, oh, this is what the future is going to be like, or necessarily that this is how the future should be either. It's more that, well, this is, seems to be a possible future. I, I think about it and I then end up comparing, contrasting with our present and which things I would like it to be most Star trek and which things I would like to be less, you know. It allows me to have different kind of 
yeah, a different framework. I guess I'm just repeating myself, but like a different framework on on approaching the present, essentially. So yeah, I didn't even have a question with that. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, okay. So we sort of wind down and wrap up a bit. I wanted sure. to ask you. Um, well, I had one more question. One sec. Um, yeah, just so that you already talked about it, so you don't have to get into it too much, but. I guess if we can bring up again, or like a kind of a last thing, the, 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 how you marry in some sense practice-based research with fiction, because there's something that you know, it's definitely in the spirit of everything we already talked about. But if you can kind of uh, flesh it out a bit more, that's okay, because I just I like the topic. Yeah. Well, no, it's a it's it's a good question because uh, it started out as I mentioned as my master's thesis at ASU, and. You know, I formulated it as this pure, you know, I was not doing an MFA, right? I was not, uh, I needed to do, my, my thesis could not just be a work of fiction that was judged purely on its merits as fiction. I was doing an MA. Um, so there, there had to be this, this uh, you know, non-creative component to it, um, which was good. It was very helpful. I mean, I chose that program on purpose. Um and I, so the, the sort of research project I came up with initially was to do use a, a methodology called practice-based research to explore the, the sort of challenges and opportunities of trying to write really rigorous climate fiction, right? Of trying to write about climate, not just sort of from my own head, but, but guided by, uh, scientific models, scientific uh, by, by scholarly um, scenarios and and like some of the specifics about, you know, very few of which are, are in the book. Right. But but I think percolate um, percolate the uh, uh, throughout the, the, the world building of like some you know, you can go onto the SSP database and see what each SSP implies about like population in different countries and uh, things like that, right? So some of those those like data points are like informed my world building. Um, so the pra so practice based research basically means that like you're a creative and you are studying your own creative process, right? You is a purely subjective form of research, right? You are analyzing what's going on inside your own head as you do whatever it is you do, right? Like be it like dance, paint, whatever, right? Then you go and you reflect on, um, and you, you reflect on, on the, you know, the internal, on the mechanisms of that, right? You, know, you kind of provide a meta, meta commentary, right? So the, so the research be, is a common and and you consider the creative product part of the research. So the the sort of the research then becomes the movie plus the director's commentary, right? Like and and as a whole, you can say you can say something about the creative process in a particular way. So so that was where I started, and and I did do a bunch of that. Though I think in the over the course of the project, settling it into the SSPs, settling it into the COP, all of which kind of ended up giving the stories a little more of a scholarly uh, bent, right? Like there's some very, some, some very academic discussions that are kind of like had in the, in the bounds of fiction uh, within those stories and hopefully in an entertaining way. Um, but, you know, I, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. It's hard, like this post-normal fiction stuff. That's where I came up with that term. I think it's really difficult to do um, because you kind of are, are constantly uh, questioning just how impactful it can be, right? Like as a, it, it requires a lot of faith to do this strategy, right? Like to, to say that like, this is the thing that I can do that can influence um, our, that can like help save the world the most. Well, like, okay, my strategy is I'm gonna write a book and then people are going to read the book and that book is going to change their actions so that they are then going to uh, impact the political process in a different way. Like maybe they're going to demand 
action from their politicians. And then those politicians are going to uh, pass policies, hopefully, as a result of the, the, the pressure or the desires of their constituents. And those policies are going to like subsidize different kinds of infrastructure and uh, regulate others. And as a result, then we will build a bunch of solar panels and shut down a bunch of coal plants, right? That is based, that is like the sort of theory of change. Like, oh man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of links in that chain that could, could be weak, right? And I mean, I think we all know where the links are, right? It's the politicians, <laughs> the politicians passing, passing stuff. But, um, I, you know, nonetheless, I think the, so the, I guess the other thing that that like came up as I was sort of thinking about this in the process was it's, but it's not just a matter of uh, do we tell people to like call their senators or something right? that it's a matter of informing the populace about the institutions that are making decisions for them. Right. People need to know about the cop because the decisions made at the cop are going to affect every single person on the planet and every generation to come. Um, so, you know, tens of thousands of people go to the cop every year, but that's like a tiny sliver of humanity, right? More people just need to have a sense of the vibe of these places and <clears throat> understand like the mechanisms by which they do politics. Because I think when we understand that how, how these things work, then we're more empowered to go out and, and make demands of them. We're more empowered to, um, think about how we want to uh, affect them and, and uh, you know, what it, it helps us be more strategic. So it's not just a matter of, of I think, sort of te- mo- motivating people. It's a, it's a matter of, of honing our praxis. Uh, and that's one place where, yeah, I think stories can be really useful, right? And where I think solar punk is really valuable because they don't, solar punk stories don't just tell you do something about climate change, they they give you a sense of what what those things can can you can do might be, right? Um, both in terms of like mitigation and in terms of adaptation. You know how how to prepare now to like live through disasters, right? Um, how to like different you know very interesting sort of. W- systems that we could embrace to reimagine core parts of our society, our agriculture, our transportation, how, and how these things are entwined with things like our family dynamics, our, our community sort of agreements, right? Um, All that is stuff that's like, solar punk loves to explore. And I think is like, so, so valuable. Yeah, uh, obviously I completely agree with that. Um, Okay. So, as with all the time, like with every episode, if that's okay, what are three books that you would recommend to our listeners, and and why those three? Um, yeah. So, um, well, obviously, I think you know the other big uh, work that is like mine that that is like this one is Ministry for the Future by Stan Robinson, Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, I, I email him occasionally, so I get to call him Stan, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it, which is another one of these kind of like story, like climate realist, uh, climate solutions based books that are about the political process that we are like actually using right now. Uh, I would love to see more of these written. Um, so, pe- but people should definitely read it, right? It's like a book that's just full of great stuff. It's full of like really moving moments and stories. Um, And, uh, you know, it's some in some ways it's like a fantasy of of uh, like how we get out of this. And in some ways it's also like very doable, practicable path, you know, sort of map. Um, And my book doesn't like give a map, right? Like my book is is uh, uh you know even the the utopian scenario like i just kind of hint at at things that happened uh to to get us on the right track uh, but you know he really dives into what some of those might be um and then like go and sort of read his the 
is coming because like like all books right like the what they they get written and then they get published like a year and chain or two later and then you like spend a year being like okay had i written this book now i would have written it xyz ways and he's he's said he's written a bunch of stuff about that that's really interesting um i would also say um people should read andre small how to blow up a pipeline uh, which is just a really, uh, I think, important piece of, of discussion about climate action and climate strategy, and from you know from an activist perspective, um, it, it's you know it's very European in context, right? So I know some Americans have like gotten mad at at the book for uh, not sort of sufficiently talking about uh, anti pipeline activism in in uh, you know particularly the indigenous American context. But, um, but I think, I think, you know, kind of diving into the, these questions of, of just how we shut down the fossil fuel, uh, apparatus are, are really important. And let me see, I'm glancing at my bookshelf here. Um, well, this is a, <clears throat> this is a little bit of self, self promotion, but, uh, there's a really interesting volume that just came out. Uh, in Australia from an Australian press called 12th Planet Press called Phase Change, Imagining Energy Futures. I have a story in that book co-written with Corey J. White, but <clears throat> but there's also a bunch of really interesting stories uh, by uh, a ton of other super great authors, Paolo Bacigalupi, Greg Egan, Kat Sparks, Paul Graham Raven um, are just some of the ones that I know. And you know, I, I really like it as a project of saying that, like, you know, let's let's uh, not just have stories that are um, that are like pro or anti cli- climate action, right? Like, let's let's have stories that show the next set of debates, right? That that show what we're going to be arguing about at a future point in in the process and and so i think there's a bunch in there that are really interesting and useful including my own story so uh does that work as in terms yeah, of yeah you, book, absolutely book I've, recommendations i've only read the first one um kim's book uh, Kim Hobson book. it's a really really good book um i've been i'm in this um kind of like a climate anxiety discussion group uh, we meet once every couple of weeks and it's one of the books that i recommended we like this or the others read because you know, it's you know, it has its flaws, its critiques, what have you. But it, it's uh, again, I find it very useful to think of different scenarios as being uh, t- different scenarios being presented as realistic ones. Like this, this might happen. Like this might be a way forward, what have you. Not necessarily this is the best way forward or whatever, but like this is a way forward. And just thinking of it's almost like exercising that muscle of of applying. Uh, futurism or science fiction and that sort of thing uh, to to the present. So I do appreciate that book. Uh, the second one, I have heard of it. I know of the polemics around it and whatnot, but I haven't read it yet. But definitely, it looks good. And the third one, I have I hadn't heard of it until now. So that's amazing that you recommended it, and I will definitely check it out. Um, other than that, are there like where can people find you? You know, plug your stuff. That's sort yes. Of thing. Uh... Yeah, I you know I have a website www.andrewdanahudson.com uh, that has pretty much all my stuff on it. Um, probably the best way to follow my work is via my newsletter, uh, which is solarshades.club, uh, and I'm I'm taking the summer off from the newsletter because I'll be at a at a workshop and just need won't have the the capacity. But I'll be back in August. Um, and, you know, I use it to kind of write about a combination of things like the talk, like we talked about here, a little like stuff about my garden, uh, a little the sort of stuff from my life and my process. Um, I don't know. It, it's an evolving project, but please do sign up for it because it will be the, be- the best way to, to keep up uh, with what I do. And I usually publish every other Sunday. So... And uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I don't tweet that much because uh, it's a bad platform. Uh, but do you can follow me on there. Uh, I'm Andrew D. Hudson. I'm on Instagram. I'm on 
you know, I'm pretty easy to find uh, if you use my full name around. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, if you see a piece of fiction with my name on it, please read it. I, I am inches away from finishing my my next novel, and we'll see if hopefully that one gets. It's not a climate book particularly. Um, it's a pandemic book. Hmm. But it was like the one that I needed to write over the last year. Sure, yeah. And uh, ho- hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll eventually be out for people too. Amazing. I mean, I'm su- I'm a subscriber to the newsletter, so I recommend it as well. Um, Thank you. Okay. Well, on that note, Andrew, thanks again. Thanks for coming on again. Oh, it's great to see you. Great to to be on again. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Defy These Times is hosted by myself, Joey Ayoub. I am also its producer, researcher, writer, and sound editor. If you want to help turn this project into a full-time job, please head out to patreon.com slash times to support it. These episodes are part of a bigger project, which includes resources, a newsletter, and eventually YouTube video essays as well. As always, thank you for listening and take care.